Good. Um, okay, well, um, good morning. I, I'm sure you all know uh, you've had uh, um, this experience. You're in a, a, a party, and somebody comes up to you and says, and what do you do? And you say, I'm a computer scientist. I work for Microsoft, and I'm really interested in functional programming. And they say, oh, I think I'll go and get another drink. But nowadays, I say, I work for Epic Games. And they say, ooh, that seems cool. And off we go. It's, uh, it is. It's a lot of fun. This is, um, uh, this is actually the Unreal Engine. It's, it's a recording, of course. But this was actually rendered on a PlayStation 5 in real time. It's really a very impressive piece of kit, the um, Unreal Engine. Um, and it's quite exciting working for um, an outfit that's, that's doing things that is very positively engaging to a lot of people. Um, and the verse programming language is, is a bit to do with that, as you'll see. So, um, in this talk, which I'm going to tell you a bit about first, it would be a lot more fun for me if you would um, uh, sort of engage me in a bit of dialogue. Let's have sort of questions and discussions and comments as we go. If you wait till the end, I shall feel very, uh, you know, sad and unrequited. Un, um, uh, so please, please do that. Okay, so, um, let's see. So, that means you've, uh, now you've had enough fun. That's all the fun um, done. Uh, uh, for this talk. I want to introduce you to my boss. This is Tim Sweeney. He is the original implementer of the Unreal Engine, which I've just shown you. He is the founder and chief executive of Epic Games, which is quite a successful company. It's about four or 5,000 people now. Um, and uh, Tim has been thinking about um, sort of big thoughts for a long time, as well as building a successful game company. In particular, he's been talking about the metaverse for a long time much longer than, much before it became fashionable with other companies. So just to frame what Verse is about, because he, think, he, say, he says Verse is the programming language for the metaverse. So I have to tell you a little bit about um, my understanding of Tim's vision. So I think he, he um, although um, Fortnite and all of that is a, is a kind of game, it's really um, an immersive 3D virtual reality place in which a lot of people already hang out, hundreds of millions of people already hang out and talk to each other and interact with each other. And so the idea is to sort of grow that from a narrow combat game into, it already is grown to something called Fortnite Creative, which is a place where you can build new games and share them with other people, into something yet more ambitious, which is a place where people can interact with each other and indeed do business and share things of value. Um, um, in a, uh, some kind of real-time 3D simulation. So the way Tim puts it is he wants it to be kind of like a space with rules but without a corporate overlord, right? So he, wants it, he doesn't want to have just a walled garden where provided you do exactly, you know, what we want you to do, everything is fine. No, it's a place where it's more like the high street, if you like, um, or a public square. Um, but that places quite a lot of demands on the, the implementation because then it has to be a place where lots of different um, programming languages and implementations can interact. So it places very high um, uh, requirements on standardization. And so this is so this is Tim's sort of big vision. And so then uh, then do we need a new language to do this? Could we all do it all in C++? Well, probably we could, um, or maybe Lua. But um, so objectively, I don't think we need new, la new language. Um, but Tim has been thinking about programming for you know, 20 or 30 years. He has a lot of very clear ideas about how to go about programming. So I, I sort of start with the, uh, the thing at the bottom, which is seize the opportunity to think anew about the enterprise of writing software. That was where I started at Cambridge back in 1980 uh, or so. Right? Uh, when I first learned about functional programming, I thought, ah, at last, this must be the way that programs should be written, right? And, that, and it didn't really matter that you couldn't write any useful programs in a functional language at that stage. It just seemed this is the right thing. And I think Tim is seized by that same sense of let's do programming right. But then there are lots of things about um, uh, writing code that can be written by, um, uh, written by millions of programmers who do not know each other and run by hundreds of millions of users or billions of users. It's all got to be very transactional with very strong interrupt guarantees. So this is wildly ambitious. You know, everything from learnable as a first language to usable by hardcore developers. This is a pretty ambitious vision. So, um, you know, I, will we achieve all of this? I don't know. But it's a ex pretty exciting ride. And I want to share a little bit of that ride with you. So, 
Um, uh, so the, the the other thing about this project is um, it's 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 like we've we're, we've launched into the into the sky a prototype of verse. This is um, ship verse or beta verse, and you could get it um, right now and run run verse programs. And people are I know thousands of programs are already using this language to build games with. Um, but meanwhile, we're doing this um, research project essentially, which is about um, this grander vision of a programming language um, that Tim has been thinking about for this long time and, and my job is to figure out what this is and then so if we launch one rocket we're busy designing you know version two as it were and then we have to launch that and we have to meet in orbit it's all quite scary um, but also quite exciting all right so um so here then uh, is what's been going on. Tim, you see, has been thinking while he's been running a company, in the back of his mind, he's been thinking about programming. And there's a whole lot of stuff that he's been thinking about. Um, and he is an extremely original thinker who has the benefit of not having been through a traditional programming language, you know, uh, undergraduate, postgraduate, PhD sequence. So his mind is not tramlined, right? He is a very broad thinker, which is quite exciting. So uh, what's really going on then is that he has all these thoughts and I'm over here along with Leonard and, and uh, uh, Ranjit and Stephanie Wyrick and Guy Steele and we're trying to suck out of Tim's head all of these ideas and make sense of them and re-express them in notations and using the intellectual scaffolding that the programming languages community has developed in order to turn it from a sort of cloud of um, sort of interesting ideas into a precise thing. That's our goal, okay? That's my job. Um, so, and this is, of course, as soon as you start sucking on a plate of spaghetti, what typically happens to you? You get the whole lot in your lap. Uh, and there is quite a lot to verse. It's quite a complicated language. So you just have to apply our usual tools of um, try to keep things simple, try to write down calculi and rules and theorems and so forth. We just try to work really hard at that. But it, it's, slow, it's slow going. Um, but it's very entertaining, actually. Very entertaining. I'm enjoying it a lot. So I'm going to share a little bit of that with you um, today about what is verse. OK, so that's the big picture. So far, so good? All right. So. Uh, what is Verse then? So, um, Verse is a declarative programming language. So that's a good fit with what I'm interested in. I'm a functional programmer. Um, so, in particular, by declarative, I mean that variable, a variable names a value, a single value, and that value does not mutate over time. It isn't the name for a cell that changes its value over time. It's just the name of a value. Um, of course, Verse, like Haskell, has mutable um, values, as mutable cells as well. But they are, well, they're a distinct kind of thing in its fundamental calculus, variables name values. Um, it has a static type system that I'll show you a tiny bit about, and an effect system, so it doesn't use monads for dealing with effects. It has a sort of effect system um, built in as well. So um, it's a, uh, but the, uh, you know, so it has a, a lot of the, the attributes of um, you know, traditional um, languages, but as you'll see, it looks quite distinctive. But in particular, the most distinctive feature is it's a functional logic language. Um, now, you may have heard of functional logic programming. I hope that you, I'm sure you've heard of it. I hope to share a bit more about what a functional logic um, language is as, as we go along. Now, um, because it's quite, the source language is pretty big, um, we're doing what we usually do um, in uh, programming languages, which is to define a, you know, some kind of core calculus kind of language into which we can translate or de-sugar the, um, the main source language. So generally speaking, source code will be in blue and uh, you know, this uh, sort of calculus code will be in yellow or, or what's coming out as green on this screen. Um, so you might think of the source language as a bit, like, a bit similar to Haskell um, and uh, the core language has been a bit more like the lambda calculus. That's our transition. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the big picture here. So here is a little... Um, taste of what the, uh, you know, the conventional bits of verse. So it's, it's just a little functional programming language with um, expressions. So you can have integers, you can have um, arithmetic. Uh, uh, in verse, arrays and tuples are the same thing. So this is a, you can say it's a, a pair or a tuple, but it's also just an array with two elements. They can nest, of course. You can index them with square bracket notation. Um, and uh, you can, of course, pick elements out of uh, um, um, out of them. Okay, so that's that's all fairly conventional. Um, bindings look like this. So there's the um, uh, in Haskell you might say let x equal three in blah blah blah. Here, yes, Gabriel. Yes, yes, please. Oh, 
Oh, that's right. Yes, so I, so I, t I said it was statically typed, yes. Um, uh, but, <coughs> um, but no, tu like, like tuples, um, arrays do not, uh, so, uh, the, um, uh, the elements of this data structure do not have to have the same type. You can impose on top, as you'll see, uh, and say, in this array, all the elements do have the same type. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, but it's not built into, it isn't that there's tuples which are variegated and arrays which are the same. There's just one kind of thing, and the type system is layered on top of that. Basically, only tuples as a data structure. Tables. tables. Like uh, are they like records? These well, these don't. These ones don't have named fields. I'm going to stick to tuples and arrays. So, so this is this is partly this uh, sort of uh, this process here. The only way I can keep myself sane is to sort of try to bite off a little part of the pile. So there are there are. Um, uh, kind of um, data structures that are mapping from field names to values, so there's much more like records. Uh, but I don't know enough about them yet. Do we keep to simple data structures yeah. or have more complicated things? Like, um, what, what sort of more complicated things? Oh, so I should say Verse also has these classes and inheritance <laughs> that I'm still, I, have, I don't yet understand yet. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's, there's quite a lot more. Um, so I'm going to tell you about, as it were, the, I've been trying to carve off um, larger and larger chunks of verse to understand a piece of it in detail. Um, but if, you ever try, if I ever try to understand the whole thing at once, then I go banana so. Um, but, but yes, certainly records and name fields, definitely, and, and in fact some kind of object and class system, in fact, as well. Who was the designer? Yeah, the sheet yeah that's Tim as well. Um, so Tim and, and, a, and a bunch of engineers, you know, so, so uh, the, you know, e Epic employees who worked with Tim to design a language that was, um, you know, shippable. And it's implemented in C++, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, let's see. So bindings. So when in Haskell you might say, let x equal 3, here in verse you say, x colon equals 3 semicolon. Right? That's just a notational thing here. Um, you can define functions. You, this defines a function f with a parameter x, um, and uh, it's, right, its body is x plus 1, and that's the end of the definition, and here is a call of the function. Okay? But, he, um, and, but you can also, uh, uh, lambda is perfectly first class, so lambda calculus is just a subset of verse, and, uh, so, but verse uses infix double arrow as the uh, lambda notation. So this is lambda x, x plus 1. Okay? Um, and here I'm binding f to that lambda and then calling it. Okay, so nothing very unusual here. Okay, um, so then we can, then there's, of course, there's conditionals, and these bindings can be recursive. So, yes, here, here's a re recursive factorial function. Okay, so far so good. Now, the, what makes it a functional logic language is two sort of distinctive factors, which you'll see in pretty much all functional logic language, existentials and choice. Okay, so existentials first. So, so when I said here, in Haskell we'd have let, in verse we got this colon equals. Actually, in the core language, it looks like this, right? That, there's, that this, this existential here brings x into scope, but just says x stands for a value. But I'm not telling you anything more yet. And then later, in this case, immediately afterwards, but it doesn't have to be immediately afterwards, we can... Um, we can constrain x by saying, by the way, the value of x is the pair uh, 3 times 4, 4 plus 4. Okay? But notice that, that the bring into scope, this isn't one construct. This is two constructs, the existential and the equation. So that there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's um, exists to bring things into scope and an equation to constrain things. Okay? So we've torn let apart into two pieces. So I'm just going to give you some other examples on this slide. So here we'll have to pause a moment to look at them, right, to show what can you do when you have this kind of expressiveness. Well, so um, here's the thing. I'm bringing three existentials into scope, and I'm constraining x by this equation to say it's the pair of y and z. So I haven't fully constrained x. I've just said that it is a pair, and its first component is y, and its second component is z. Here I'm constraining y, and here I'm constraining z, and then I might have a body here that mentions x, y, or z. Okay? Now, um, uh, here, uh, this is a little stranger because here x gets to be um, a pair of y and z, but y and z are not 
are only in scope locally, right? but this is fine. It just says there is a Y and Z, and X is a pair of that. Um, and, then, um, and then here, I've constrained, since I can't mention, I can't do this, because Y isn't even in scope uh, down here. So I just said the first of X, uh, this is an, an equation or constraint, the first of X is 3 times 3, and the second of X is 4 times 4. And this, so this does the same thing now, except that Y and Z are, of course, not in scope in body, just X's. Does that make sense? That's kind of obvious enough, really, once you get the idea of that. Once you've torn apart existentials, it's easy enough. So, um, and moreover, you can pass these existentially quantified variables as arguments. They're completely first class. So here, I've said X is an existential, and I'm passing it to F before I've given it a value. Right? And inside F, what happens? Oh, I constrain the argument V to be 3 times 4. So here I've passed the as yet unconstrained X to F, which constrains it, and that means that in down here, I know that first of x is 3 times 3. No? Okay, so this is, this is functional logic programming. Right. The little, uh, little, but you can see it's quite expressive, um, at least. Um, and uh, here's a classic, you know, you can run things backwards kind of example, which you will see in every course on prologue, you know, ever since the, begin be the dawn of time, people have written little examples like this. But just let me show you that this is all, this is functional logic programming embraces this. So swap just swaps over x and y, returns, it takes a pair, returns a pair. And so swap applied to 3 and 4 is going to return the pair 4, 3. But if you apply swap to a pair x, y, where x and y are logical variables, and then you constrain the result of swap to be 3, 4, well then, x gets to be uh, f 4, and y gets to be 3. Is that, did I get that the right way around? Does that make sense? So you can run swap forwards and backwards. Of course, you can't run all programs forwards and backwards. And this, you know, you should already be thinking uneasily, I wonder exactly what will work. Right? How exactly does this work? Um, so. That's what we've got to figure out. So, but, and so the, the answer to that is largely by where we just, um, uh, just imagine that um, execution. In fact, Tim said to me, it, it's amazing when the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, founder and chief executive of a multi-billion dollar company uh, is on the phone to you. He says, Simon, it's really quite simple. To execute verse programs, all you've got to do is solve the equations. And I'm <laughs> thinking, you know, that's what I should be saying to you, Tim, but no, it's the other way around. So what we do is we've we just got um, a bunch of equations here, and we... Uh, solve the equations. Well, how do we solve the equations? Well, we know how to do that. It's called unification. We've known it for decades, right? Just solve equations by unification. Get the values of, of x, y, and z, and, and, and off we go, right? We can't always do that. Look, if I had constrained x to be x times x, ooh, ooh, right? Now we've got to solve a quadratic equation. Um, and it's not hard to write um, you know, programs which to run them would mean solving Fermat's last theorem, right? So, it's, uh, so clearly there are limits to what you can do, and again, it's the business of a programming language designer to describe exactly the limits so that users of language know which programs will run um, and which will just get stuck. This one just gets stuck. It can make no progress. So far, so good? Yeah, please. Do you go from lazy to strict? Actually, it's a bit funny here um, because, because of these equational constraints, you can't really be lazy, right? Because, uh, like, if I, um, if I took, uh, uh, I don't know, this program here, and I thought, well, this constraint here, I don't really need to run it, right? It's just, it's not demanded. How would you know that a constraint was demanded, I suppose, is the trick. It might just be E1 equals E2. So... Uh, so verse actually has to be at least eager. It has to evaluate everything, a bit more like a, the, you know, the, the ID data flow language, which everything gets evaluated in the end to make sure that you have found all the constraints. Um, but you, um, uh, you don't want it to be exactly strict either because, let's see here, if it was a call-by-value language, then you'd insist on knowing the value of x, and x doesn't have a value yet. In fact, it's going to get its value. So... So we say that verse is the closest we can get is to say that it's a lenient language, just somewhere between strict and lazy. This was a, a term invented by the, the MIT Dataflow folk, in fact. So it's a good question. It has a slightly squishy answer. <laughs> okay? So far, so good? Uh, okay, so now we've got, we got this, um, uh, the idea of existentials, equations. That was ingredient number one uh, here. 
existentials plus equations. And ingredient number two is choice. Um, so here's choice. The thing is that an equation may fail, right? Three equals four. What's that supposed to do? That fails. Is that bad? Does that mean crash? No. It just means the, that expression yields zero results. So in a functional logic language, the failure of unification or failure of equality is not a bad thing, like you know the square root of minus one or head of the empty list. It's an ordinary thing that happens in ordinary program execution. Um, and the way to say it is that an expression yields multiple values. In verse, every expression can yield zero results, one result, or many results. Expressions are, are multi-valued. And in fact, that's expressed pretty directly in the language with the choice operator. So you can say the expression three vertical bar four is an expression that yields three and then four. You can imagine it's being like an iterator in Java or something. Um, and this, this whole expression executes not by binding x to a sort of multi-value of three, four. No, no. It instead, it binds x to three and then evaluates x plus one, returning four. And then it binds x to four and then evaluates x plus one, returning five. Do you see what I mean? So it's like a list comprehension in, in, in Ascom. Yeah. It's a non-commutative operation, as we'll see. You might think at the moment it could be, maybe, does it yield a set of values? But actually, we'll see shortly, it yields a sequence of values. So choice is, in fact, not commutative in verse. Yeah. Yeah. Was this originally a design in Icon, or is there another source for multiple evaluation? Oh, there's, I mean, it's, so Icon is a, you know, a, a very venerable language, which, which verse, you'll see other, other, other echoes of Icon in this. So, but in fact, all functional logic languages really, you know, um, Icon, Curry, Mercury, um, and uh, Fresh, there's quite a few of them. They all have really existential variables by some name or another, and choice and failure. So I don't think it's exclusive to Icon, but it certainly shows up there. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, so maybe the notation, I mean, it, because you're saying if you're going to do this, it should be commutative. But it isn't, I'm sorry. And there's only so many ASCII characters. Um, and you'll see it does have, it does behave in some ways. you see shortly, a bit like all, you'll, you'll, um, you'll see. But, it, but the truth is, it is not commutative. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Pattern match is not commutative if you use the uh, Right, pattern matching is not commutative, yes. Um, uh, okay, so let's see. Uh, so multiple choices, I, I stread here, I bind x to 3 and then do the rest, and then I bind x to 4 and do the rest. So if there are multiple choices, you might imagine this iterates. I bind x to 3 and then do the rest. The rest means I bind x to 99 and then do the rest. So this is like a, a list comprehension in Haskell, um, uh, like this, and we get um, all, all pairs out of this expression, right? So you should think of it as being, it's as if Haskell's list comprehensions are built into the fabric of the language. Um, Okay, so far so good. Yeah. Um, now, uh, the no this is where the non-commutativity really shows up. Um, you can capture the zero or more values returned by an expression. You can capture them in an array or tuple, right? So this four, or in the in the calculus we actually call it all, but in the source language it's called four. So I'm using four here. Um, says take all of the values returned by this expression in sequence and form them into an array or tuple. Um, so this one, this enclosed expression returns four and then five, and so the whole expression yields the array four, five. Okay? Um, and that's a pretty simple idea as well. Um, and so it means that there's this sort of interplay between data structures and, and this sort of what feels a bit more like a control structure of these um, choice. Um, and that is a, this, this now is a distinctive feature of verse. Most functional logic languages treat the um, uh, choice as a top-level thing. Choice and existentials as top-level. All of the existentials are at top level. And when you run your program, like when you run a prologue program, um, there are some unbound logical variables, and it prints out some bindings for those variables. And then it says, and now here's another case. I could print out some different bindings for the variables. But that's all rather a top-level thing. Um, so. Uh, by encapsulating choice and wrap, be, then being able to wrap it up as a data structure. And this is foundational to verse. It's t you, typically, 
In a functional logic language like Curry, you can do this, but it's a bit of an extra thing. It's not part of the very fabric of the language. And it means that this is, and verse is also deterministic. If you talk to Michael Hannes, who's the author of Curry, he'll stress Curry is non-deterministic by design, whereas verse is deterministic by design. You get the same array every time. Okay. Yeah. Isn't um, what in, in yeah, Lam lambda, prologue. lambda prologue? Oh, lambda prologue. Um, it has been combined with the implication and uh, introduction of new. Uh, uh, so this is Dale Miller's stuff on lambda prologue, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. So I don't think I understand lambda prologue well enough to give you a, a solid answer, but I'm I am pretty sure that it is actually rather different. Um, that's, you know, I've, t I've talked to Dale a little bit, but it, Dale is a very clever man, and I'm never quite sure that I've understood my conversation with him. <laughs> um, so I feel a bit inadequate there, yes. Why do we need to have a different notation for? Why don't you use comma? Uh, well, uh, we, we've seen quite a few with commas in, haven't we? Uh, like here. Uh, oh, why did he choice at all? Well, um, because you, um, because sometimes expressions yield um, uh, zero. Um, you don't know how many values an expression is going to return. Like, in fact, I'm just about to. Um, yes, here, here is one. Uh, right. So for conditionals, and this is straight from Icon, by the way. For conditionals, um, this, the, the, um, uh, if if succeeds, that is, returns one or more values, you take the then branch, and if it fails, you take the else branch. So if you statically knew exactly how many results, then indeed, yes, and the examples I've shown you are all, are all very static, but the number of results returned can be extremely dynamic. Um, so here, um, fails is just synonymous with returns zero values. Succeeds means returns one or more values. And greater than fails, uh, or so, so it succeeds if x is bigger than 20, and fails if x is not bigger than 20. By fails, I don't mean goes wrong, I just mean returns zero values. Okay? Uh, and of course, if it succeeds, you have to say, well, um, uh, what does it return, uh, what, what value does it return if x is bigger than 20? And the answer is x, that is the left argument. That's the definition of greater than. It's if, if um, x is bigger than y, return x, otherwise fail. Okay? We never return y. Uh, yeah? I don't know whether this has anything to do with Lisp's generalized Booleans. I don't know about Lisp's generalized Boolean. never heard of them, actually. And I know, I've read quite a bit about Lisp, but maybe I'm going to go, I'm going to go and look that up now. Yeah. But it's certainly exactly what's in icon. Um, so this, is, this goes back a long way. It's a very nice, simple idea. And it's kind of cute. I mean, look what, uh, you know, 0 less than x less than 20. What does that do? Uh, less than um, brackets to the right. So x less than 20, if x is less than 20, it returns x. And now we can compare it with 0. And if that, and then we'll, so we'll get zero out if x is between x. So something you might write down in mathematics works perfectly well in icon and verse. Oh, maybe icon is le left associative. Oh, man. You, you've got a good historical memory. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that in verse it's right associative. I see, okay. Um, so there is no Boolean type. There's just failure and success. Um, and... Um, and that lets you do, you know, a number of kind of, I, I don't know whether they're, uh, sometimes you don't know whether something is deep or whether it's just cute. Um, I'm going to let you judge. But this tuple here, just think, what, what does a tuple mean? A tuple in which the expressions can fail or return multiple results. Well, if you have a tuple of two expressions returning multiple results, you would expect to get the, the Cartesian product of all the values, right? Um, but if one of them is empty, what's the Cartesian product of all the values? 
empty, right? So this is going to fail if either of them fail. So um, although it is literally just the data structure, the tuple data structure, this, will in, this does in fact um, check that if x is less than 20 and y is bigger than 0, just like a, just like a mathematician might write it. And the or, uh, going back to your question about uh, uh, vertical bar, um, when does this succeed? When does it return any values at all? It will return any values if this returns any values or if that returns any values. So this works perfectly well as or. And in fact, you can even do it like this. If x equals 3 or 4, that works perfectly well too. Kind of cool. Um, but as I say, probably just cute. No, no, I mean, in, in an if, if this expression produces one or more results, then you just return E1 once. Ah, so uh, I have elided that. But in fact, you can, you can um, inverse, you can say, if um, x colon equals something, then blah, blah, blah. And if you're in the then branch, then you get to see the value of x. So in fact, bindings in the condition scope over the then part, but not over the else part. That's a funny scoping rule, but it's extremely useful. Um, I decided to elide that from the talk, but it's totally passive source so first. Your, your if is like a runtime test if the expression is an empty type. The, run, the if is like a runtime test whether the expression is an empty type. Well, or just that it, it's a, whether the expression yields zero values. If you want to say that it's the empty type, fine, but uh, I'm going to stick to if the expression yields zero values. That's the if is a runtime test for that. Yes, totally. Oh, so right, yeah. So the question about is, could this, be, could this ever be efficient? Well, um, so uh, let me see. Games companies are very interested in efficiency. Um, and I think they, the hypothesis is that very often we'll, not, we'll be writing programs that do not explore, exploit weird data flows, in which we'll be, you know, we'll look at it and we'll say it's a C program, really, and we'll just generate code like C. Um, and I think the shipverse people are doing that more or less because they're in a very small subset. And I think it remains to be seen whether we can do a really good job of that as we grow the fully implemented language. But it's a good, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, well, so so what role does cut play? That's a, I say, yes, that's a, that's a tricky question, isn't it? So in a way, uh, so let's see, there's a kind of cut even going on even here. Supposing E1 yields many values, then when we get the first one, we just throw all the rest of them away uh, and go into the then part, right? That's a kind of cut that says, so, and, the, um, and there is a left to rightness about that. Remember, this is back to the asymmetry of choice which you didn't like, but it, you know, it comes up again and again, that it's the, once the first one succeeds, blam, if the first one fails, then you must try the second one. Yeah, so it's, there's something of that flavor there. Um, but it isn't, um, yes, um, I think it's better behaved than, than a, the sort of free-floating cut. That, uh, but I, I would love to be able to substantiate that claim to better behaviedness in a crisper way, and I don't think I can do that yet. Yeah. yeah. You can, you can use this microphone so people are yeah. uh, I've been doing this in Icon about uh, 20 years ago for combinatorics problems. And specifically, if you write your choices correctly, you have full control about uh, where it stops. And uh, you can actually evaluate very complicated expressions and just stop as soon as you get your results. It's actually incredibly efficient and very, very good to oh, program this kind of stuff. Talk more to you. Yeah. Incredibly efficient and expressive. Yes, I love hearing this. <laughs> I'm going to ask you for some of your examples. <laughs> um, uh, but the old, old is good, right? Everything, everything old is new again. We see that, you know, in AI, for example. So uh, let's see. I just want to quick. I want to move on to talk about um, how we're we doing for time. So semantics. We started at um, quarter past, didn't we? Um, indexing. So arrays can be indexed. 
We index them with these square bracket things. Um, indexing out of bounds is just failure. Right? Again, it's not bad. It's just failure. Um, so, uh, so that, oh, I said I wouldn't say this. Here is an example of binding something in the component of an if like this. So this says, if um, A is I, it, does that succeed? Right? Does that indexing operation succeed? If it fails, I'll go into the else branch. If it succeeds, I'll get the ith value of A's, call it X, and X is in scope in the then branch. Right? So um, arrays and, uh, behave very like functions. OK, uh, this is a kind of um, uh, increment. So this 4 says, um, uh, now what's this 1 dot dot length? So that's, a, that's, that's just notation for the choice. 1, 2, 3, up to n. So that says the choice, 1, 2, 3, oh, it should probably, been, probably should have been 0 up to n minus 1. Sorry, I think I got a, off by one error. Um, so this is a choice of n values, the length of a's. And then for each of those, I'm going to return, um, uh, I'm going to return the, the increment of the um, value of the array. So this just returns an array that is um, in which every element is one bigger than the element of a. Okay? It's just like map increment over the array. All right. Okay, I'm going to um, skip narrowing, um, but I just I just want to um, mention one other um, thing that might be less obvious, but becomes you know becomes super important. Look at this program. Um, if x is um, so x and y are ints here, uh, but I don't know the values, then I test x's value here and do something, and then I really only give x a value later. So what I do not want to do is to treat this as a constraint on the value of x that sets x to be 0. You see what I mean? That would be a bit silly, because I'm trying to ask x whether he is 0, and so I'm somehow waiting for somebody else to give him his value. That's what ifs do. Does that make sense? Um, so, um, uh, so some languages solve this by having two different equalities, a, um, a unification operator and an equality testing operator. Curry does that, but Verse does not. Instead, it says because this guy is in the condition of an if, somehow x is rigid, whereas here somehow x is flexible. And so now I'm waving my arms, aren't I? Right? Rigid, flexible, mumble, what does that mean? So I spent about nine months doing this with Tim, right? trying to figure out what was supposed to happen. Um, but and now we have to try to uh, be, be a bit more precise. right? So. We actually need to um, figure out what this language means, and it doesn't scale very well to just ask Tim, which I have to tell you is what, uh, you know, certainly the Max first team, but actually the engineers also would do quite a lot. <laughs> we still say, we better ask Tim what it's supposed to do. <laughs> so really we've got to do, you know, a, a standard programming language thing and figure out what this language means. So what are we going to do? Here, we're going to build this little intermediate language that I described. It's not a core language that's meant to embody the essence of verse. It, it won't be big enough to embrace, like, this particular fragment doesn't include mutable variables, for example, but it gets us off the ground. It gets us, it gets us to the point where we can say something with precision. And, that's, and this, is, this whole building is about saying things with precision, right? Foundations. So here, I'm hopefully, we're getting closer to where you live. So you should think of this as being like the lambda calculus. And indeed, it's got the la the are lambdas. Lambdas and tuples here are values. So values here um, are, can be head normal forms, head normal forms, literals like numbers, operations like greater than and less than, tuples and lambdas. Um, interestingly, a value can just be a variable. That's a little unusual, um, but a, a, in, a, in a lambda calculus, a value would usually be like 3 or a lambda, but not just x. In verse, x on its own is, counts as a value v. OK, and so expressions E, uh, well, we've got existentials, we discussed. We've got choice, E1, E2. We've got applications, V1, V2. Why are they values? They don't really have to be, but um, this is a form of um, A and F, right? We're going to, um, if, they, if we had E1 applied to E2, we could always say, we could always invent a fresh variable um, for um, E1 and E2, let's say X and Y, and then write X applied to Y. Right. So, it's a form of um, administered normal form here. Uh, fail is just the unit for choice. It's the expression that yields no values immediately. Um, here's existentials. Um, 
Now, here are, uh, here's the semicolon. On the left of a semicolon, we can have these eek things, which is pronounced expression or equation, right? So the thing to the left of semicolon can be an expression, or it can be, this is the only place equations can show up to the left of semicolons, and they all look like value equals expression. Um, and again, if you, have, if you had E1 equals E2, you can always let bind um, one of them to get value equals expression. Okay? Yeah, Gabriel. Well, uh, so the question is, um, I said it wasn't called by value, and yet here, always as a value is an argument. But this value can be an variable, which is equated to an unevaluated expression. So you could be my guess whether you call that call by value or not, but it doesn't seem like that to me. Yeah. Yes. So if, I, um, um, if I'm in Haskell and I have a function that returns maybe of int, right, sometimes it will return nothing. Now you could say to me, Simon, that's a debugging nightmare. You just return nothing. And wouldn't it be better to throw an exception? Um, right. Uh, what? Yeah. So, so I think it's just you shouldn't think of failure as going wrong, as being a bug. It's not. It's just like false. Sure, I mean, a debugging programs is hard. Yes, but I, I, and, and I suppose, you know, the more expressive the language, the harder it gets to debug, right? A debugging, you know, a language that didn't have any control flow at all, just a sequence of machine instructions, right, with no, no branches, that would be, e you know, the more expressive it is, the harder it is to debug. So it's a reasonable question. Um, but I don't think it's a, well, I, I think pointing the finger at fail, returning zero results, is the wrong place to point it, right? Um, sort of existentials and choice, the whole panoply of, yeah, that, that makes it harder. Like lambdas, oh, super hard to debug high-order lambda programs sometimes. Yeah. So, um, uh, I've not thought about debugging burst programs at all. So I'm sure it will, I'm sure it will be, it will, it will have difficult corners. Okay. All right. And this, by the way, is all untyped at the moment. Right? Because I want to say, if I have a static type system, so, so here's the story. Milner's story was well-typed programs don't go wrong. Right? But what does it mean to go wrong? It means that I have some language which is essentially untyped or has runtime type checking, right, that says, so add checks the tag on its arguments to say, am I adding an integer to a Boolean? If so, wrong. And the type system is meant to make sure that never happens, and so you don't need to implement it. But you need to have a kind of non, uh, you know, an, an untyped language with this runtime testing to be your criterion for success. So that's the story here. This is the untyped language. The last thing I mentioned, um, all is the thing that, uh, there's that for thing that I mentioned. And one is what's used for if, to say one, um, if, if, e, if e returns multiple values, e re, uh, one of e returns the first of those. Okay. If e returns no values, one of e fails. Okay, so that's the language. So the, the main point about lingering on this slide is, ha, huh, okay, so now we have a language of tractable size. Right? You could imagine trying to work on this, uh, whereas source verse is much bigger. There is no branching? Oh, there is no branching. Well, um, oh. Not uh, visible. It's not visible here, but there is actually branching. Um, because one, if the... Um, um, if, if the, uh, well, because I've got an operation greater than one of these guys, which can fail conditionally, right? And once I've got conditional failure, which is built into greater than, now, if I say one of x bigger than zero choice something, now I pick one or the other, right? So it's not very obvious, but it's right there. Yes, good question. Good question. Yeah. Um, oh, that's right. I come from the, the Monsieur le Directeur. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
OK, so now we have to give semantics to this language. So I'm thinking, no, Tim, uh, I've got to figure out what this means. So how do we give semantics to it? So one possibility, and this is the one that Tim had gravitated to to begin with, is to have some kind of operational semantics. So you'll be familiar with this. You can you, um, sometimes say, well, well um, for a functional language, you might have a, a triple, a state of the machine, an abstract machine that has a, a heap, an expression, and a stack. And you write transition rules that take heap, expression, stack, triples, machine state to machine state. Um, and so here's an example taken from a paper by uh, Sestoft here um, uh, for a functional language that says if you've got uh, a heap gamma and a, a, an application and a stack, then you push the argument onto the stack and your new focus of execution is the function part. You've, you will have seen this before, right? Um, so this is fine, but it is, uh, it's fairly low level. And if, you, if you're saying to programmers, this is what your program means, it's not very satisfying. And for verse, you, there's a lot more going on because there's backtracking and choice and who knows what kind of stuff and unification going on. So it's quite, well, it's called operational semantics and it is quite operational. So it's good, but um, uh, we might wonder about what about a more denotational approach? So then you, you see pictures like this that say the meaning of an expression is a function from an environment that gives values or denotations to, it's for the free variables of E, to some kind of value. And then you might say, well, um, or maybe over here, uh, already we can say, so this should be a set of values or maybe a sequence of values. So the meaning of fail will be the empty sequence. The meaning of a value would be you know, a unit sequence. The meaning of a choice would be some kind of union of the sequences. So you could see this might go. And then, then you come to a shuddering halt on um, existentials. The meaning of exists x dot e is presumably the meaning of e in an environment extended with a binding for x. What value do we bind x to? So I spent a long time thinking about this. And in fact, I think we do have a kind of story. You can, you can, you can actually say, because this is maths, you can say, well, maybe it's the union of um, all of the meanings of, x with, um, of, uh, of e with x bound to 1, and the meaning of e with x bound to 2, and the meaning of e with x bound to 77, and the meaning of e with x bound to lambda v dot v. You could imagine binding x to all possible values in the space of all possible values, and then taking the union of all of those results. And then you begin to think, oh, uh, uh, um, maybe, um, maybe my sets are too big, and I'm getting into Russell's paradox, and um, then you... Um, so uh, it becomes a little bit mathematically scary. So then you phone up Stephanie Wyrick, um, who is a cock um, expert. So, so we are using cock big time to do denotational semantics for verse. So, uh, but I don't, uh, using uh, filter models or graph models, those of you who know about this. But I'm not going to tell you about that either. Um, so the third, a third possibility is to use um, rewrite semantics, right? So you might imagine just using... Um, uh, following the lead from the lambda calculus. After all, this looks a bit like uh, lambda calculus, right? So maybe we should just do a lambda calculus-like thing and write rewrite rules. Um, and indeed, that is often, for functional programming, how we explain the meaning of programs to programmers, not just to semanticists. We say, you know, if you've got this function call, just replace the call with a copy of the body instantiating the bound variables. What could be easier than that, really? So um, you've uh, you know, got some expression that you're evaluating, and we can rewrite 3 plus 2 to 5, or we could inline foo, here's the definition of foo, we could inline foo and turn this into let x equal 3 plus 2 and then the body of the function x times x plus 1 and then there are lots of directions in which we could rewrite this but lo, whichever order we take we always get the same answer. Right? You've been imbibing this with your mother's milk. Right? This is just so, you know, simple, pretty intuitive rewriting. So of course the, the general idea is that you are going to um, uh, have rewrite rules that, um, uh, that can be applied anywhere, at any time, in any order, and you should get the same result. Of course, if you're going to think of this as an execution mechanism, you'd need a rewriting strategy to choose which you rewrite first. But, but um, if you're trying to explain to a programmer what the program means, you just say, you can choose. Just keep rewriting, and you'll get the answer. That's a nice story to tell, isn't it? So um, the trouble is, how are we going to express this unification and iteration business using rewriting? 
Right? Now this, I think, now we get to something that I think had not been done in the functional logic literature in the same way. Um, so we just, uh, like all good computer scientists, you should uh, steal ideas from other people. So um, uh, we stole this idea from um, Zina Ariolo and Matthias Felice and Phil Wadlow and John Morris and Martin Ludersky's paper about the call by need lambda calculus. Because there, they, they took the idea that instead of doing um, uh, this game for lambda calculus, they said, well, look, maybe we can, um, uh, maybe we can reify the, um, uh, rather than doing call by name or call by value, um, right, we could express call by need by adding let to the language so that, um, um, uh, uh, so that when we do a beta reduction, instead of waiting for the, uh, the, the argument to be a value, we can just, um, um, uh, we just reify it in a let. So have I got an example here? Yes, here's their, their thing. We augment the term syntax of the classical lambda calculus with the let construct to represent a reference to an actual parameter in an instantiated function by a let-bound identifier. So that um, um, uh, it's, it's as if it, this, is, this is like um, representing the heap. This is like a heap in which the um, cell at address x is bound to the thunk y plus 1 that we haven't yet evaluated. But instead of being done, uh, you know, separately in some, you know, component of a machine state, it's simply expressed in this, this syntax of the term. It's such a simple idea. Such a simple idea. Yeah, Gabriel? Explicit substitutions is, yes, that's kind of another flavor of the same thing, but typically that's a sort of, yes, that's like an extra piece of syntax. This is like an explicit substitution that you might almost think was part of the original syntax of the language, but most languages have let anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah, but it's the same idea, so, so it's pretty simple. So maybe we can use the, um, uh, the very same idea. So, and here it is in action. So uh, here's, here's a, um, a program in which I've got exists x, x is, and here I'm saying, I'm constraining x to be um, a pair in which the first component is 2 and the second component is a fresh existential. And here, uh, the second component is 3 and the first component is a fresh existential. How might I do rewriting on that? Well, you might imagine I could float those existentials out. That is probably a valid rewrite rule, probably. Right? And then maybe after I've floated the existentials out, perhaps I can choose one of these x's to substitute for. Let me substitute for that x with this equality. So I replace that x with 2 comma y. So now I get this over here, right? 2y is equal to z3. And now what are we going to do? What would be next? If you were thinking, how could I execute this program by rewriting? What would you do next? What was that? Decomposition. Decomposition. Right. Yes, you take this. Look, this pair is equal to this pair, so the components must be equal. Right? Obviously, so, so here we just split this guy into two to get z equals three, z equals two, y equals three. Now we can substitute for y and z um, and... Uh, uh, do some substitution, and finally we end up with um, uh, this guy. Here's all the bindings for the variables, and finally the result is 2, 3. And now we can garbage collect these guys, because nobody's mentioning x anymore. Right? So there you go. So all of that stuff with existentials, and, we're, and including, incidentally, this business about flexible and rigid and so forth, uh, because we just need to add some rules for one and all, they all play very nicely in this, in this story. Um, so let me show you some of the rules. So... Um, uh, uh, these unification rewrite rules. So we've got k1 equals k2. That can um, that just goes away entirely. If k1 is equal to k2, we just get e. This guy. And if not, it's going to fail. Um, uh, I didn't write. I haven't shown you that rule here, but it does. Tuples to decompose. Um, uh, head normal forms. Uh, other head normal forms are going to actually fail. So lambdas are actually going to be not equal to each other in this. Um, and what else? Oh, and the key rule is the one for substitution. Right, when I did a substitution here, what did I substitute? I substituted for y. Right, y equals 3. Replace that y and that y with 3. So that looks at a substitution rule that says, in some context x, if I see x equals v, followed by e, then I can substitute v for x in both e and in the context itself. Right. So this substitutes in, in both directions. So you get so the, the whole set of rewrite rules looks like um, this. 
I just wanted to show you that. So I'm not expecting you to read these, but it is nice that they fit on one page of a popper paper. Well, it's an ICFP paper, actually. Um, these are all the rewrite rules for this little core fragment of verse. Now, that's a lot more rewrite rules than the lambda calculus, right? A lot more. Um, but it is also doing more. Um, and actually, if, if you're using the, uh, the Wadler, Ariola, Moraes thing, um, then you need quite a few extra rules to do administrative reductions there. So some of these are just administrative reductions, like um, these ones here, floating existentials out. Do you remember we did that? That's a sort of administrative rule that moves the existential out of the way. Um, if you've got a semicolon to the left of a semicolon, you can flatten them out. If you've got a, um, an equation whose right-hand side is a semicolon, right, you can move this inner equation outwards here. Right? And so, um, so these are, these are, uh, this is the, the way in which we're trying to give a semantics to verse. Semantics to this, at least this fragment of verse. And the choice rule, this again is, is a rule that is, uh, I really like this, but it's not original to us, of course. Every calculus with choice does this. Um, but it's great that it works. It says, in some context, E1 choice E2, um, uh, I can rewrite that to the context wrapped around E1, choice the context wrapped around E2. Um, so to take an example, if I've got X plus Y choice Z multiplied by 2, I can move the choice to the top, but I have to duplicate the context, the X plus something times 2. It's X plus Y times 2, X plus Z times 2. It's like continuation passing style or something. Right. So this is not original, not unusual, but it's, it, it just works in the usual way. Okay. Yeah, uh, Jean-Jacques. It's not exactly the right rule. It's conditionally. It's not what, conditionally? Conditional rewriting. Conditional rewriting. Oh, you mean because there are side conditions like this one? Yes, it's conditional rewriting. There are, I mean, there are, there are side conditions like, um, oh, I don't know, here. I, I said, well, what's this? That's K1. There was the one which had a condition, wasn't there? Uh, yes. Um, you know, if K1 equals K2, so it is conditional rewriting, yes. Um, it's not just a purely syntactically driven, yeah. Um, incidentally, this side condition here is only to stop this rule applying infinitely so that uh, rewriting has a hope of terminating. Okay. Um, so, um, there we go, yes. George, yes. Yeah. Where is termination? Good question, right? So particularly in the presence of recursion, you wouldn't necessarily expect to see termination because... Um, uh, where is recursion? Well, um, it's difficult to prevent recursion, right? Where, where's my syntax back again? Um, how can I uh, prevent recursion? I've got lots of these equations which say x equals e, and it's hard to prevent you saying x equals something involving x or x equals something involving y, and semicolon and somewhere else, y equals something involving x. So actually, recursion is very hard to prevent. It's not like just don't have let rec. Um, so, um, and also, we want recursion too, right? And then, and if you want um, a rewrite system uh, for, I mean, if you took Haskell with recursion, and ju you could then rewrite factorial, and you keep rewriting factorial in the right-hand side of factorial to inline the call and then inline the call so, of course, it doesn't terminate. You, they, to get termination, you need some kind of evaluation strategy. It's the same in verse. Okay. Uh, let me just see how we're doing for time. Okay, so I should um, get towards finishing. Um, let me, I just want to say a bit, a bit about confluence, right? Um, which is that, um, uh, uh, really, we'd like these rewrite rules to be confluent, right? Because if different rewrite sequences yield different results, like, if I could rewrite it to 3 and take the same program and rewrite it to 4, that would mean we didn't have a deterministic semantics at all. So it would really be good for the uh, rewrite rules to be um, confluent. But it's quite a big system to prove confluent, and in fact it isn't, for a very tiresome reason. Um, this is called the even-odd problem. I shan't go through it in, in great detail, but here is an example. X is the pair 1Y. Y is just lambda z dot x. Um, and then if I rewrite this one way, I can get y is uh, lambda z 1y and then 1y at the end. If I rewrite it in another way, um, depending on which whether I substitute for x first or y first, I can get this term, which looks different, but will behave the same, right? So the differences are very tiresome. They are, it's a syntactic difference, but not a semantic difference. 
Um, and confluence is a very syntactic property. So confluence is too strong, really. Um, we don't need confluence. So one, uh, one possibility is to somehow stick to non-recursive programs, and that is kind of what the proof in the paper does. But a better solution, really, is to weaken the notion of confluence. And, and amazingly, it's Zeno again who, who did this, um, invented this idea of skew confluence. We're busy trying to prove skew confluence for this language. Zena, by the way, says, Simon, you shouldn't be trying to prove confluence anymore. That's so, you know, 1990s. Uh, you know, we, should, we have more advanced semantics methods. But actually, compilers do this rewriting process all the time, right? That's what compilers do. They rewrite engines. And if the compiler can re write it, rewrite itself into a corner, which it cannot get to the best answer because, you know, the system wasn't confluent, that would be bad. So I really would like it to be confluent. And I think we can. Yeah, Gabriel. Could you, make, could you make it conflict by adding more rewrite rules, Poss possibly even non-terminating ones? Maybe so, yes. It's a tricky thing to get right. Um, and if you're, uh, this is actually an appeal for, for help. So we're working on skew confluence, but if any of you would be interested in thinking about how would I prove confluence for a language like this, it's, a, it's at a scale which is difficult to do on pencil and paper. So you know, we need mechanical support. Does anybody know about a program called COC? Um, that's a, which could help us here. Uh, there's quite a big piece of proof engineering to do here, um, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't quite know how to do it, but in my bones I feel that it would be, confluence is something that we should have for this because it's what the compiler does. I don't want to paint itself into a corner. Okay, now, um, I, I want to spend, uh, we, we started 15 minutes later, it's now, so I think we've been going exactly enough. So I'm going to do five minutes on types and then stop because we've had questions. Is that all right? Yeah. So, um, but I did want to tell you a little bit about types because I know you're kind of, you, you, you're asking about it already. So, in verse, types are rather unusual. A type is simply a function that may fail. A function that, fa if it fails, it means the argument is not a member of that type. If it succeeds, the argument is, so int is a function. It is not a different kind of thing. It's just an ordinary function which fails on strings and floats and succeeds on integers. Actually, it's the identity function on integers. So, um, and all a function does is it applies its argument type to its argument. So this really desugars to lambda i, apply int 2i, bind that to x, and do e. So, um, and the types don't even necessarily need to be identity functions. The absolute value functions are perfectly good. You can use it in a type position like this, and all it does is it applies abs to the input, which may fail, but if it succeeds, it'll take the absolute value and give that to x. Yeah, kind of strange. And you can write your own types, like nat. Um, you can just define nat to be a function that succeeds if x is bigger than or equal to zero and fails otherwise. And then NAT could be perfectly useful as a function. So perfect, NAT types are perfectly user-definable. Um, and um, they can also very easily be dependent. Mm -hmm. Well, do we replace type annotations by guards? Well, this is the source language. This is the an intermediate language into which it is desugared. Now, you could say this, was, this is kind of like a runtime type check, right? That's what it means, a guard, if you like. Yeah. And then you might hope that you have a verifier that... It, it, like, like in Erlang. So, but I mean, ha, 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 yes, often you have guards that guide program execution, and some of them are runtime tests. Some of them you might hope to statically eliminate. It's the same thing here. So, it all has much more like scheme contracts than it's like Haskell types. Right. Um, I, I just want to remark that it's easier to define types that are dependent. So, here's something that takes, a, um, takes an argument, well, it can be any old thing, checks that it's a pair. Um, checks that the first element is um, an integer and that the second element is an integer and then checks that the second is bigger than the first, right? So you get sort of, you can really write quite elaborate types this way. Um, and uh, I, I did just want to show you this, uh, this thing. What is the, the, well, the pair type constructor. Pair isn't the magic thing. It's just a type, it's just a function. What does it do? It takes two types, T1 and T2, and, of course, then it takes an argument that it's going to check whether it is a pair of T1 and T2. What does it do? Well, it checks that um, the argument x is a pair, x1, x2, and checks that x1 is of type T1 by applying T1 to x to get y1. And then it applies T2 to one, which might fail, to get y2, and then returns the pair y1, y2, right? So it transforms the pair. Um, and for arrays, what is the array of type constructor? Array of T... 
What must it do? Well, clearly it must take something, check that it's an array, and then for every element of the array, it must apply the type to the ith element of the array. So the array of type constructor is the array type constructor. Where have you seen this function? It doesn't, you haven't seen it looking quite like this before. It's a function that takes an array and a function here and applies this function to every element of the array. It is usually called map. So, in fact, the array type constructor is the map term level function. Isn't that weird? So at that point, I think, oh, OK. So Tim has clearly been thinking something pretty interesting here. You know, we should work on this. I think this is a very cool observation. Um, the verifier is the equivalent of the type checker. Clearly, it can't always verify a program, but the idea is that verified programs don't go wrong, and the verifier is going to get smarter over time. That's the idea. We just got to nail down what the verifier actually is, right, and figure out what. Mm, what's wrong? Verified programs don't go wrong. Well, um, uh, let's see. If I um, take a function that says it takes an integer, um, uh, like uh, this. Uh, this, this lambda, if I apply it to something that isn't a nat, right, then we should go wrong. Right. We sh that, that we're trying to statically guarantee that you do not apply this argument to a function for which nat fails. Usually, it's not static. Well, it that needs stack. stack. Yeah, usually you say a stack expression. Uh, what, a stuck expression. Um, yes. Uh, OK. Uh, so it might be stuck, but it might just fail. Right? The NAT will fail given a. Um, and that doesn't get stuck, it just fails. So stuck and getting failing are quite different. Yeah, yeah. So, so certainly types and terms, the, the types and terms are the same thing like in a dependently typed language. So the, so the verifier, indeed, part of its business is, the, you know, this type checker thing, it has to execute arbitrary verse programs at compile time in order to do its verification job to check that when you run the program, it won't go wrong. Um, uh, so all of verse has to be executable at compile time, perhaps by rewrite rules. And indeed, our, the verifier we're building is really just a whole bunch of rewrite rules. But you can see that execution and verification and what it means to go wrong, it's all become a bit blurry here. And where the, the name of the game is to try to uh, you know, nail it all down. Um, and so I'm going to, um, um, I'm going to finish uh, at this point. But just we can t talk about it. We can go on as long as you like. I'm here the rest of the day. But I'm conscious we should always finish. Um, uh, I've only told you about a sort of core piece of this. There's transactional memory. There's mutable variables. There's effect systems. There's classes and objects. We're just, you know, I'm just biting off a little piece of the pile of spaghetti. Um, but it, it's, um, it's ambitious. And I, uh, another thing I like about this project is it's very open, right? So um, the only reason we haven't open sourced the implementation yet is that we're ashamed of it, right? It's not um, that, and that whereas, whereas this um, work we're um, publishing, uh, not so ashamed of, but very eager to interact with the community about. This isn't a, a sort of, you know, I'm just dribbling out little bits and some, there's something in the works. We're, we're keen to interact with people to, to build an, you know, an, an open ecosystem around Verse and to discuss its technical properties and engage perhaps some of you in, in helping work on its technical properties. Um, so it's quite, I think it's quite exciting and fun. Um, any, anybody got any other questions or observations? As I've sort of reached the end of the, the talk as well. Yeah. So, um, so we've seen a quite unusual language, which is uh, very exciting. Did you, what, what experience did you have of uh, users uh, coming from more traditional languages to uh, using Verse? How well did they adapt to that language? Yeah, I don't really have any experience of how well users have adapted. Yeah. Partly because the language I've shown you, the functional logic language part, um, isn't really available in, you know, usable by third parties form at all yet. We've just got little sort of prototypes running. Um, so we have a few internal people trying it out. But the, in the verse, that the language that's shipping is much more conventional. So I'm not sure we'd know from people's use of that how well they'll adapt to all of this. So I think it's kind of like a grand experiment, really, um, uh, at scale. It's a bit like when we first when we first built Haskell or, um, you know, or Sassel or KRC or any of those languages, 
we, we just built them because we thought this is the right way to, to write programs, and we'll see. We'll probably have to adapt the languages and change it in the light of experience. I don't think it'll be. So, but no, we don't have any user studies. Not yet. Yes, is there a danger that people will, will take verse and, and use it in a very conventional way and not use any of the sexy features? Absolutely. People do that with Haskell all the time. You know, and in Monads, they write C programs in Haskell. And people look at it and say, I wouldn't write it like that. Say, but that's what I'm used to. Um, so yes, there is, I think. Um, we'll have to see. I think it'll be a, quite a long time before we know. I'm, the whole functional logic, the functional logic programming has a long history, but it's quite a, a siloed one. It's not, it's not taking the world by storm. And here we are, you know, Tim's goal is to kick functional logic programming out of the lab and into the mainstream. And that is, that, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how well that goes. I think it's pretty exciting, but I don't know how it'll turn out. Um, yeah. Why is Tim interested in functional logic programming? It's because I think it's because um, it, you, you could see that when, when you say, um, let's write down some equations and solve them, yeah. that's kind of an attractive way of thinking about, um, you know, I'm trying to express the solution to my problem and let the computer work out the answer. And so I think it all grows from that kind of root in his mind. Um, I think he has, um, he's quite ambitious for, you know, connections to um, mathematics more generally. But I don't, I, yes, um, I don't, I'm not sure I can really articulate it any more than that. Exactly, yeah, I think it's just remarkable, just remarkable, yeah, um, yeah. Do you have any time frames for when are you going to publish a compiler? I mean, it can be worse. Oh, oh, when are we, yes, time frame for publishing a compiler. Well, so, as I say, the, the, there's something you can use today, but it doesn't have this stuff in it, right, and there's a paper. Um, as far as we have a reference interpreter on the go, right, and I think we're hoping to release the reference interpreter in 2024. Um, uh, and the reference interpreter will cover all of this, by the way. Yeah. How does the OO paradigm fit into the purely functional design? How does the OO paradigm fit into the, uh, uh, the purely functional bit? In, in particular, are your objects Are the objects mutable? Yes. So objects, objects can certainly have mutable fields. And indeed, the, the whole, um, in the end, because of mutability and side effects, verse ends up having a fairly strong left to right flavor. Right. It's not just that choice isn't commutative. There's quite a lot of things that are not commutative because, that, that, because particularly if you're running a game, there's a lot of side effects going on all the time. You don't want to make it too um, clumsy. So um, uh, I, don't, I don't have enough clear understanding of and tangible experience of the object part of the language um, yet. Andrew Myers at Cornell is spending a sabbatical year working on verse, and he, that's his main focus. So I think we may learn more from that. But I don't think I can give you a meaningful answer. It's the, the short summary. Yeah. I'm not, uh, not an expert in this, but I would just like to know, uh, presumably with Tim, he wants to write games. Basically. He wants to write games, yeah. What does he write them in right now? Oh, how do people write games, or how does Tim write games today? The answer is they either use C++ um, or, um, in, at least in this sort of the epic world, um, there's been a visual programming language called Blueprints, which is kind of like a da visual data flow language. You write, um, uh, you, write uh, you, have, you, you draw blocks and arrows between them, and the arrows carry data. They may be data flow arrows, and also they can be control flow arrows that say this must fire before that does. Um, and so this is quite, it's quite appealing for doing some kinds of programming, but it doesn't scale very well. Um, and there's also something called Fortnite Creative, which is, um, uh, I think you, you, you program games by um, sort of dragging blocks and altering properties on them. So it's, it's kind of like, provided you are fitting within the paradigm that the person who set that system up were thought of, I don't know, um, uh, walls and uh, creatures that jump and so forth, you can set how high it jumps, but you can't make it do something entirely new. So versus filling a gap, um, between C++, very expressive but pretty hard to use, and blueprints, um, uh, very easy to use but doesn't scale very well, versus sitting in the middle. Uh, 
So, so I, think it, I think it's already being used, this shipping version, by being used by thousands of people to do exactly that because it fills this gap. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. And the people who are using it are really using the new construct or they are just using it as a, an imperative language? Uh, or can you oh. identify the places where the new uh, features are really useful for the application again? Um, well, so one, I suppose one half is, um, uh, the question could be two, two halves. One is, if you write, you can write a program that looks much like a conventional imperative program. And if you do, then you'd like it to run like a conventional imperative program fast. So that's a compiler question, right? And then the other is, um, do you ever, is the extra expressiveness ever useful? That's, um, uh, and um, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not really the right person to ask. I'm not, I'm, uh, as it were, my job is to, in, in to uh, is the intellectual endeavor of understanding what Tim's thinking and making it precise. Um, and uh, and I think we'll, I, I mean, I think he strongly believes that these more expressive features will be powerful and useful. Um, and we'll have to see if he's right. But he's, he's written a lot more games than I have. So I would trust his opinion over mine any day. Yeah, Gabrielle? Uh, I was planning to ask the same question, like yeah. what is the killer application for, uh, for the uh. <laughs> oh yes, so this is about concurrency and transactional memory. So that does involve non-determinism in an interesting way. Yes, so um, you might imagine that, so this is connected to gaming. In any game you've got lots of characters and bits of kit that are moving around and interacting with each other and they, and the only way to make them interact in a, in a sort of um, scalable, secure way is um, transactional memory seems like a good way to do that. So then, of course, there is non-determinism going on because one player is doing one thing and another player is doing another thing and they both got independent bits of I.O. So, yes, just like in Haskell with the I.O. monads and concurrent threads, we're going to have just that kind of non-determinism. It's just that, a, a, that the fragment that I've shown you is perfectly deterministic, but their side-effecting interaction through transactional memory will be very non-deterministic and will be um, and these, this transactional memory by the way is meant to be at least data center scale this isn't just within one processor um, we want to build a, a data center scale transactional memory uh, uh, predicated on the idea that in, in games of course you only interact with pieces that are in your physical locality in the game physical locality right so you don't you don't have transactions that involve widely distributed things so we hope that we may be able to make that scale even across you know, thousands of players working in a big uh, virtual reality. Yeah. Whereas at the moment, Fortnite, for example, the reason that um, in Fortnite, if you play Fortnite, you can only have 100 players is that's, you know, one, one uh, server can run 100 players, but it can't run 1,000. Yeah, no, yeah, no. Unification. Unification, yeah. Ah, what happens if you unify functions? Yes, very good question. I asked this on about day two, and I still haven't got a very, very um, good story. So in the, in the, um, in the rules of the paper, um, unifying functions just, um, is just stuck. Right. Um, so uh, the, the, the best story is don't do that, and the verifier will tell you if you do, is the goal, right? Because it's, that's, not, that's not a desiderata. That's not something we're trying to achieve. Right. It's just something that's a little difficult to avoid, so we're going to um, avoid it statically. And we avoid it statically just by saying, stuck. Um, yeah. So at some point you mentioned the filter model. Yes. So I, I, I was wondering whether you have like intersection types, and this, this because it, it seems related in some way to some of your Oh, so the question is about um, if you're using filter models for the denotational semantics, does this get you into intersection types? Yes. I have no idea. We should ask Stephanie. Huh. Uh, I really don't. And we have a, uh, so she's building cock models of the lambda calculus and the lambda calculus extended with existential variables. But I don't think, um, she hasn't used the word intersection type in our conversation so far. Uh -huh. Perhaps that's all I could say. So the interpretation of the equality. Hmm? 
Or what's the interpretation of equality? Yeah. Um, oh, yes, that is an intersection operation. Yes. So that, that's right. One of, the, one of the things, which I thought was remarkable, that um, when we were first talking about semantics of verse, this was uh, like a, um, a year and a half ago, uh, and um, uh, Tim uh, uh, was this... Uh, yes. Um, uh, uh, we were talking about choice, just union. And, and, and Tim said, and of course, unification is just intersection. Um, you take all the values that can come from E1 and all of the values that can come from E2 and take the, the intersection of those sets and of course it really is. And so and that also gives me hope. That makes me think, oh, if there's a sort of transliteration that's that direct, you know, choice is union and equality is intersection, something good is going on in your language, right? I think I had a good feeling about that observation. And I thought it was remarkable that it came from him. Because I, I hadn't thought of that. I thought, oh, Tim, you're right. <laughs> And uh, semicolon is Cartesian product, more or less, as well. Um, anyone else? Um, oh, uh, yes, right at the back. So about concurrency. Yes. What kind of properties would we like to prove about concurrent programs? Yeah. Well, um, I think you might hope to prove things like um, if you've got you know, a certain amount of um, you know, virtual money in the world, you might like to prove that it's conserved, uh, right? That you, uh, you don't sort of randomly make it or lose it. Um, in tra and transactional memory is quite helpful for that kind of thing. Um, what else might you like to prove? That if, you know, yes, if somebody's got the sword and he gives it to somebody else, then, you know, at least somebody has the sword. It doesn't disappear. I suppose that's the same kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't really got as far as thinking about concurrency at all. Um, but what, what do you have in mind? Oh. Yeah, that's a reason that all that but you you also work in a particular context. So concurrency brings about a lot of issues. Yeah. So what's wrong? Or in other sense what's right. And that's why uh yeah, I came up with the question. Yes. It can take a lot of time. Yes. Hmm. Um it's a reasonable question, I don't think I really know. Um but I do know about about the wrongness. I do know that I'm tr we're trying to uh, also the rock to which I cling is to say that if a program rewrites to wrong or stuck, that means that something has gone wrong. That should never happen, right? Um, so we would like to statically exclude such programs. That's, that's what the verifier is trying to do, right? The verifier is going to say, verifier programs do not go wrong or get stuck. Then we need to say what it means to go wrong or get stuck, and that's what the rewrite system is supposed to do. Um, now... Um, once you've excluded those programs, now we might talk about concurrent programs, and maybe there are other ways in which they could go wrong or get stuck, like just deadlock with each other. And indeed, real concurrent programs, you know, like a game, could indeed deadlock, you know. If a, one player is not willing to do anything until the other player gives him, uh, I don't know, a sword, and the other player is not willing to give him a sword until he gets a bow, then they're going to be deadlocked. And nobody's going to be able to stop you writing programs like that, I think. Um, as a game author, unless you have some clever sort of you know, next level up analysis tools that analyzes your game and says, can it ever get stuck in a deadlock? Uh, you had another question? No, no, somebody had another question, maybe, or maybe not. Um, yeah. A possible application might be? Oh, the stock exchange. Yes. I suppose an application of a large-scale concurrent distributed, yes, transactional memory system could be a stock exchange, yes. Um, yeah? Uh, I don't think Tim's currently planning to build a stock exchange out of uh, Verse. <laughs> but it, I suppose it could be. Um, there's a lot of competition there. <laughs> and with incumbents. Okay, shall we back up? Yeah? Good. Thank you. Thank you so much.